Hello there, this is Kimberly Wilson, and welcome to the 474th edition of Tranquility Du Jour, bringing you tranquility since 2005. Tranquility Du Jour is a series of nourishing conversations about living a full and meaningful life with doses of tranquility. And considering how challenging December can be holiday time, I wanted to bring you episodes each week this month. So in this week's edition of Tranquility Du Jour, I chat with returning guest Elizabeth Duvivier. Learn her process for writing this intimate exploration into the lives of two sisters and their mother, and all of the relationships intertwined. And listen towards the end, there is a giveaway of this amazing book. Now, those of you who might be new to Tranquility Du Jour, there is a link in the show notes, which can be found at KimberlyWilson.com slash 474, where you can learn more about the community and a big, big welcome. A few things that we have coming up. December 29th, which is a Sunday, I am hosting a one-hour free online event via YouTube Live called Planning 2020 TDJ Style. Now, this is for anyone who has purchased Year of Tranquility, my latest book, and or the Tranquility Du Jour Day Book and registered for their bonuses. Now, this can be found, links to these in the show notes, and would love to have you with us. You'll get a private invite sent mid-December and, of course, reminders. So no worries if you don't have the book yet. Go ahead and grab it, and PDFs definitely count. Also, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, I'm hosting a New Year's Eve mini retreat from 2 to 5 at Yoga Works DuPont in Washington, D.C. Also, on January 5th, that is our next free one hour event that is the seasonal offering that I have done for years. And it's online via YouTube Live, and private link is sent upon registration. And there's a link in the show notes to sign up for this. And then finally, Tranquility in Provence, May 30th through June 5th. We'd love to have you with us. And this is at a private villa nestled in the south of France between Nice and Marseille. So you can learn more about this in the show notes. Looking for the perfect gift for yourself or someone else? Consider the Tranquility Du Jour Daybook, chock full of tips, tools, and checklists for living with productivity and tranquility. You'll find seasonal layouts, monthly layouts, weekly layouts, invitations to pause, list to complete, plant-based recipes, and so much more. This pretty planner is for the busy woman who longs to infuse more tranquility into her days while staying organized, creative, and inspired. You can find the daybook on Amazon and at KimberlyWilson.com slash daybook2019. Now, Elizabeth has been a writer all her life and a teacher since she was 19 years old. She studied at Swarthmore College, Lawrence University, Sorbonne, Bread Loaf, and the French School. Elizabeth has taught English and French literature, creative and expository writing in a variety of settings. Over the past few years, she's offered writing. She's offered classes in writing and myth at Squam Art Workshops, a community that she founded in 2008. She makes her home in Providence, Rhode Island, with her dog Remy. Elizabeth, welcome back to Tranquility Du Jour. I am so excited. We are here again. I love it. I love it. Is this like our third time? I think it's so, number I three. So. <laughs> well, congratulations on your new book, Stories for My Sister. And it's a beautiful cover and it's beautifully written. And it's a very sweet, touching story. And I'm just like, when the hell did you do this? I had no idea you were working on a book. And then you reach out to me would you like a copy of my new book? I'm like, what? So tell us um, the background of like, how did stories for my sister come to you? I know it's really funny how that went. So I wrote it last year and it wasn't at all the book I thought I was going to be working on. I had another book that I had started two years earlier at a writer's residency program, but then 
in the first week of that program where I got going, my dog Daisy died. So I, well, she didn't die, but she was dying. So I, you know, flew home to be with her and then life just happened and I couldn't um, get back to it. So then last, yeah. So a, now it would be a year ago. I'm losing all touch. But anyway, a year ago, like February, I was in San Diego with my niece and um, this story sort of dropped in to my head. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not writing a novel. Thank you very much. Give it to someone else. And I did this little dance for a couple of days with this story where I kept saying, nope, not interested. Thank you. Not writing fiction. Thank you. And then like the third day, I kind of knew like if I didn't start writing down the notes that were coming, I would lose it. So I was writing them down like, okay, I'll take the notes. But just so you know, I'm not saying that I'm going to write this book. And then I just kept taking notes all spring. And then in June, I was on a holiday that I had planned ages before up in Canada. It was a really remote, quiet place. And I was on holiday. Like I had a plan to come home and start my writing very writerly with my writing room and my writing desk and, you know, very serious and controlled and as I am. And here I am on vacation in this great big queen bed, just with a huge tree out the window. And I was like, well, I'll just see what those notes are. And I started, because they were all on the drive on my computer. And I just pulled them up and I started playing around with them. And then I looked up and it was like four o'clock. I was like, oh God, I better get something to eat. And then I came back and I didn't go to bed till midnight. And it just was like that every day for the next two weeks. I just, and I was in uh, Prince Edward County, then I was in Toronto and then I was in Montreal. And when I came back from Canada, I had about 60 to 80 pages written that were really solid. And I, and I was in it at that point I was in it. So the other book just got pushed to the side and I just started going. So that was June. And I had finished my first draft where I really had the whole full scope of it on paper. Um, and it was about 360 pages. And that was, believe it or not, this is true story. December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, is when I just sat back and was like, okay, that's the first draft. So it really came out. It came out fast and furious. It had its, I was just basically a note taker. And um, so I was really surprised by it. And that, and so what's funny is I got that all done. And then last year was all about, you know, getting it into a design and getting it printed and getting a distribution center and all that stuff. But once it was done, I was, I was done. I was ready to move on, which as you know, is not the life cycle of a book. There's this whole other post cycle where you have to like market and sell the book, which going forward, I'm going to have a very different approach to, because that's definitely not something I want. I don't want to travel. I don't want to be involved in that. I just don't. So, um, but anyway, so I was done with this book, which I was really proud of, felt great about, got fabulous responses to that I couldn't believe really. And so I was completely satisfied. And this other story dropped in last April. And this time I was like, oh, I'll write that story. So now I'm, I'm writing another novel, which is crazy. So that's the, that's the long answer to your question. Um, I just sort of, it sort of came in and I wrote it out and it was really, really, really fun. Those months were hands down the happiest months of my life. I love writing. Like I love the actual act of writing, which is not for everybody, but it's just all I want to do. You know, it's funny because it makes me think of that Hemingway quote where he's like, there's nothing to writing. You just sit at the typewriter and bleed. And so (laughs) your experience, I think, is very different than uh, what I typically hear. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. I, I've i never had anything remotely like writer's block. It's just not where I come to with writing. I just, um, I don't I don't know what it is. I sort of feel like if a story, I, I don't know, I don't want to curse myself. But um, for me, I had a real question. I'll be really honest, Kimberly, you know, I've been doing Squam for all these years. And during those years, I had this little I, you know, I'm doing this, but I really want to be writing, you know, like I had that whole thing going on. And so I felt as I was going into that summer where I finally had the time set out for myself, like I finally gotten Squam into a place where I could actually take that time to do the focus on writing that I need. And I had this 
part of me that was just profoundly curious, which was, is it true? Is it true that I really want to write? Or is it an idea that I've been holding on to all these years? So for me, it was incredibly gratifying to be, oh, no, no, no. I love not seeing humans and being in a corner somewhere for hours all day, just in my own happy little world writing. And that was really, really gratifying because I don't know, did you read Michelle Obama's Becoming book? I haven't, but I hear it's amazing. It's really wonderful. And the beginning, the first quarter is my favorite part of her and her story before she gets swept up into everything political. Um, and she had this vision. She grew up in Chicago and she had this vision. She knew where she wanted to go. She was the most incredibly focused child, like through junior high and high school, she had to do these extraordinary trips to school every day on the buses and all this stuff. And she had this vision and she was going to be a lawyer and she's going to work in this really big law firm. And she was going to have a house on a particular street in Chicago. So she had this vision and there she goes, she get, and it's no small thing, right? She got to Princeton and then she got to Harvard and then she gets into this big law firm. And this is the piece I want to share with you because I just was so grateful that she put it in her book. She comes into this law firm here. She's been working on this for upwards of 14 years without like, this is her dream. This is her goal. And she realizes she hates being a lawyer, hates it, hates it, hates it, hates it. And that terrible sense of like, Oh God, what have I done? I'm 30 years old. I don't know how she was, she was 30, 29, I don't know, somewhere in there, but I'm 30 years old. And I thought this is what I wanted. I've told everyone this is what I wanted. I get it. And I don't want it. What do I do? What do I, you know, it's a terrible crisis in a certain sense. And so I can really, really appreciate that. And I kind of wondered if that was going to happen to me with writing. If after all these years, I was like, oh, here you go. You can finally write. And I'd be like, oh, this is what writing is. I don't want to do this. Like I wondered, I was really curious, but it wasn't that. I love to, I love to write. I love it. I'm so glad. And, uh, you know, I think that you really, like, you brought these characters to life just beautifully. And listeners, let me just read you a little blurb as to what the book's about. Okay, so it's May 1993. Two sisters, B and Mona, are about to spend 10 days together under the worst possible circumstances. With seven years between them, as well as a lifetime of hurts and misunderstandings, is it too late for them to become friends? And really, this is an intimate exploration, right, of the lives of these two sisters and And their mother, Janet, and all of the Mm -hmm. relationships, you know, that are intertwined with this. And so you did, I think you did an amazing job of making the characters like so real. And so I'm curious because, you know, character development is like a whole other can of worms. And so how did you really kind of get into the heads of these these three women? I can't say I've ever gotten to the head of Janet. (laughs) I I know Janet. (laughs) <laughs> I'd have to write a novel about Janet to understand Janet. But, um, you know, I each chapter, for anyone listening, each chapter is a different sister. And so when it's B's chapter, it's in the third person. But when it's Mona's chapter, it's in the first person. So that was something I was really concerned about. I was like, how am I going to do that? You know, how am I going to make that? Because they're very different. Um, so... I had notes on the whole thing, but I pretty much wrote all, pretty much, not completely, but I pretty much wrote all the B chapters first. And then I just took a deep cleansing breath and you know, ran on the beach or something. And then came back in and was like, okay, now I'm going to write the mode of chapters. So I think I did it like that a little bit, but um, they reveal themselves to you as you go. You know, they just sort of tell you who they are um, as you go. I had I was meeting them right alongside you. I didn't know who they were either. As I say, this all came into me. This wasn't something I was thinking about. Um, What came to me that day in San Diego, and I don't know why, but was I had this image and it was a bedside and it was two sisters. And I knew there was a really big age difference between them. And I knew one of them was terribly sick. That's all I knew. That's all I knew. And I and that's where I started. And so I was kind of finding out, like, who's the one that's sick and what's her story and who's, you know, like I didn't know who was the older one or the younger one. I just and why is the other one there? And what, so that it just sort of was all like an exploration 
Um, but you know what I really need since we're on the phone and I have zero idea of your experience? What, what spoke to you about these characters or the book or anything? Like, what did you connect with? Did you like the mother? Did you not like the mother? Like, what, what, when you think of this book, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, I would say like family dynamics, right? And mm. also, you know, what I loved about B, like super confident, right? Mona's like the younger sister, a little challenging, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, and B, I don't know, it's kind of as you were talking about Michelle Obama, right? Like goes to California, leaves job. She's just like, uh, she's just someone who you're like, wow, you've got a lot together. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know, it's like the mom was always a little tricky. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I just think like seeing the dynamics, the dialogue, the way in which they played out together, um, it was just really, it was engaging. It was engrossing. Did it make you cry? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I always yeah. ask, and I yeah. love it when men, I've had a number of men read it and some of them I don't know personally. And I'll ask them and they're like, oh, I saw it. I'm like, awesome. Awesome. So I like it. Were there any surprises for you? I mean, when you started it, did you kind of feel like, oh, I know what this story is about. I know where we're going here. Yeah, right. The first chapter and the last chapter, you're kind of like, huh? Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, um, I think that was really uh, well done. Because, um, yeah, you, you, you're you like – you don't really know where it's going, but you kind of think you do, but you don't want to stop reading because you want to find out, okay, am I right? And, and you know, what happens? So, yeah, it's quite engrossing. Um, and that's kind of the, the cool thing because I don't read a lot of fiction. And so, you know, I was curious kind of with this. I was like, is this – is there anything within these characters that is autobiographical at all? So – no, it, it's not. They're not. I have two sisters and two brothers and none of them are play here. But the thing that I understand about art and writing and music being one of the arts, um, all the arts, but writing specifically is, did you ever see this movie with Kevin Klein and Meg Ryan, French Kiss? Yes. So in the movie, Kevin Klein explains to Meg Ryan how the plant he's a he's a vintner so he's a, has vineyards in France and um, he is showing her how the vines the the grapes wherever the roots are on the soil it's not just the soil it's what's growing near the soil so if they're growing near lavender if they're growing near olives like whatever's in, that goes up through the plant into the grape and you can taste it in the grape and so for me that's the vision I have with any kind of artwork or writing that comes through me. Uh, this book is set in places, most of the places that I know personally, like I've been there, or I've lived there, I've known people who live there. Um, I have a personal understanding of these places. And this time zone is a time zone. It's, a, it's before my time and a little bit of my time, but it's a time zone in America that I have access to in my own personal experience or the experience of my parents or the experience of my brothers and sisters. And so there's a familiarity. And so the story is coming through that. The story is not written in Argentina in 1840. You know, I don't know anything about that. It, I'd have to go research that. So in that sense, it's biographical in the sense that it's coming through me and it's flavored from my life experience. But it isn't a story about my life experience. Does gotcha. that make sense? It does. It totally makes sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because, you know, you're always curious, right? It's, oh, is this like a composite oh, yeah. of someone or what have you? But, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, that... exactly. Well, and I'm curious. I think, I think I'd be, I think, you know, I'm not the right person to analyze that, you know, in the sense that I don't have any objectivity. I think someone else could read it. Um, I've been really astounded by the responses I've gotten because I see the orders that they come in. And so I'd see an order from someone that I know that's taken lots of my classes, that's a writer herself. And I'm like, oh, she's going to love it. And kind of crickets, you know, I'm like, I don't think she liked it that much. And then someone else I'll see bought the book and I know them like, I don't know, neighbor or businessy wise. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. She's never going to read this book. Oh, that's sweet. She's, it's like a supportive thing. She bought the book to be supportive. That's really cool. And then I get this email that's off the charts, like, 
I couldn't put this book down. I've been crying. This is the most beautiful. It's like existential madness. Like, I just love it so much. And I'm just like, uh, I would never have expected that from you. And that's what, where I just am like, you don't know who's going to connect with it. And the other funny thing is I'll stand there and I'll ask the same question to the person who said they've just read it that I asked to you. I'm like, oh, so what did you think of this? And everyone has a different vantage point. They're like, ah, oh, the mother, I couldn't stand her. It's like, ah, oh, that poor mother, what she went through. Ah, you know, like everybody, you know, they think their, their vision of the story is the right vision of the story. And that's very, very good because that means I made it universal enough that each of us can tap into the issues around how do we get along and how do we heal our hurts and our wounds and our misunderstandings and how do we learn to be in this world? You know, it's like all those things, but particularly that sense of um, conflict between two people who by all accounts should be deeply connected. You know, I just think that's the tragic piece. And it's this, and it's the same energy that you're going to see at the world at large. I mean, like, why is Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland fighting each other? The same people. Do you know what I mean? Like, why is Iraq and Iran? It's like, why that, that sense of like, we have to find something to fight about. If we can look to our own families and find our way to be at peace with our family and be at peace with ourselves, I just feel like that's, that's what would change the world. Honestly, I do believe it because the bigger ones just get, there's something else. Anyway, see, now I'm just rambling. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me a specific question. Ask me a specific question. You know what I love too? That was the mention of, because I freaking loved her growing up as Pippi Longstocking. So dressing oh, up oh. as Halloween, I did too oh. once. So I loved this. Love Pippi Longstocking. Love Pippi Longstocking. Yeah, did it connect with you at all? Was there anything there that felt true for you in either sisters, personalities, or people you've known, or maybe some of the side characters? Well, definitely. And I think that, you know, as you're reading, you do, you're like, oh, I can relate to this or like, oh, I know someone so who's like this and would totally have reacted like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it is, you know, earlier you used the word universal. And I think that that is absolutely accurate. And um, I do love the kind of inclusions of like, you know, time period sort of things. Um, and of course, the Pippi Longstocking. Um, but I'm curious, you know, <laughs> made for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things you mentioned that, um, you know, I think that people don't really think about with regard to writing is, okay, you come out the other end, you finish the book, you have it in hand. Okay, so now you do events or you have to promote it or no one's going to know it exists. I know. I know. And you How mentioned- do you like that? Do you like that? Do you like that piece? You know, um, I did really enjoy it for my first two books. Now, they were traditionally published. And so it was, um, you know, it's like things at Barnes and Noble and stuff like that, right? So that was fun. It was really nice to see who came out and connect with. But this was kind of really early social media. It was very, very different, right? This is 06 right. and, and 2010. Right. So right. now, you know, with books, it's more of like, oh, I... You know, I'll, I'll let people know it's coming. I'll do some sort of pre-sale with lots of bonuses and then it will release. And then I love to hear people's reactions. And, you know, then I hold like some online sort of event, but I don't okay. do in-person stuff so much anymore. The last one I did, I think was 2013 and it was for Tranquilology and it was, we, we oh, did okay. uh, an event because we were then going off on Tranquility Tour, right? Where we did these pop-up right. events all over. Right. And that was super fun. But I thought, you know, if I'm putting out a book like every year or every other year, it's like to keep doing events, they're so much fun, but it's kind of like, ah, oh, if I do them online, then way more people can come. Mm. Oh, that's a great. That's a great perspective on it. That's I was just thinking, I do online, then I don't have to travel. That's like, totally. That's true. More and more people, more people can do it. That's true. Yeah, my next, the next book, I definitely will have a different approach for sure. I got kind of caught up in like the traditional approach. I didn't actually stop and think about it. I didn't have a marketing plan. And so that's where I, I think I fell down and I really need to sort of dial that in better for the next book. Because basically, I just had friends reach out to me and say, you know, oh, we want to do your book launch. and Oh, come over here. We're going to do this live podcast in London. And I'm like, well, that sounds great. But 
in fact, I learned some things about myself, which is I really don't want to be traveling that much. I just don't. It, I want to be home and I want to be writing. And right now, anytime, because I still you know, work very steadily with Squam. So anytime that's taken away from writing, it's not that I'm resentful of it, but if you ever have something you really, really want to be doing and something else is pulling at you, you know the feeling I'm talking about. Where you're just like, I just want to do this thing, you know? And so travel was great. It was great to see people, but like, I'm really good for the next five years if I don't travel. I'm going to have one event in Providence and then um, where I live and then um, everything else will be online. And as I said, I was talking to you earlier, I really want to connect with book clubs. That's, that's my jam. You know, it's book clubs where people are want a new book to read and talk about. And a lot of women at Squam who are in book clubs have been taking this story to their book clubs. And that's been super fun. And that I will participate in. You know, I'm really happy to um, support and participate in a book club's reading of the book. So, because I think that has more value because then all the questions you're asking, I don't know. It just, it just really, that's a fit for me versus I don't know, having events. I think I'd rather just show up at book clubs. So yeah, in person or, or virtually. Right. And that's the great thing too about a virtual event is, you know, it could be a book club in freaking Germany and then you can exactly record it exactly. and share it, you know, and people can watch exactly. it at their leisure. Yeah. And you don't have exactly. to fly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's just a lot of time. Travel is just, so, and some people love it, but I'm just really aware right now, um, every hour that I'm not here, writing it's just you know it's just like that I'm just in this zone right now I finally have reached this place in my life where I have the means and the structure life-wise to write and I've, and I've wanted to do this my entire life and I haven't been here before because either it was well I need the full-time job to do this or I was running a full-time job that took every drop of my energy or, or whatever it was it's here now and i just don't want to miss this opportunity. I want to get as many books written in the next 10 years as I can. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping at least four, maybe five. We'll see. But we'll see. Yeah. Do you have a writing routine? I always like to ask people this because, you know, some people it's like, okay, so I have my morning cup of tea and I walk my dog and then I sit. And then from 10 to noon, I work on my book and then I go to yoga class or, you know, whatever. I'm well, just it's curious. really interesting you ask that. I, I'm super, um, I'm a real worker bee. That's how I get things done. Um, that's how I did squam. And so I was bringing that approach to my writing and it got thrown out the window with this book. I had set up, before I left for Canada, I had set up this room in my house. I cleared everything out. And I mean everything. I have a great studio upstairs, actually where I'm sitting talking to you. And it's a wonderful studio, but it's not a place to write. I needed a very small white room with a table and a chair and absolutely nothing else in it. So I had that all set up and thought that's where I'm going to write every day. And I'm going to be just like you described. I'm going to get up at five and walk my dog and be at the desk by seven and put in a good six, seven hours. Like that was my vision. And that is absolutely not how I wrote this book. Uh, this book was written on queen beds across North America. And I found that that's the zone that just felt, it was just delicious and fun. I had my books and my notes all spread around me. And, um, I was always in a bed. That's how I wrote the book. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a very disciplined approach, but, um, and I would say for this book, when I, I had just lost my last dog, Oliver in May, so I didn't have a dog. And so one of the things that will be interesting is I now have a dog. He's a, he's a year old, Remy, that I got right at Christmas time last year. And so um, it will be interesting to see how, I am able to get those long full hours because right now, of course, you know, I get up, I take him to the park, I walk him and take him out again. And he's, he's a part of my life that is a, not a disruption, but it's, it pulls me away from me. And when I was writing this book, I could literally go 11 hours and be like, I think I should get something to eat. Like I just like would wake up and be like, where am I? What is going on? Oh, what time is it? What time, how long have I been here? I just dropped into another world, which you're just not going to be able to do when a dog's like, uh, excuse me, I need to go outside now. But um, so we'll see how that goes. In my normal life, Kimberly, I, you know, I write every day. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who journals every day. That's part of my morning start. So, um, I just wake up, I journal and then I start my day. So I think the, 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 the muscle of writing is, is well tuned within me. Um, but in terms of actually writing a book, um, it, it won't really get any structure, at least if it's any similar to this first one, it won't get any structure until there was a moment where I really did com- completely overwhelmed because there was a moment when I had over 320 pages and I had a sense of the whole book. Like I knew, I knew then the whole story, but it was sitting in all around me and I had no idea how I was going to put it together. I really didn't. I, I was completely overwhelmed in that moment. I felt like in the fairy tale where the Miller's daughter opens the barn door and it's just this sea of lentils and peas and corn and she has to sort it all. It was like that. I was like, how am I ever going to do this? But um, I saw this interview with Elizabeth Strout. And she addressed this exact issue. And I don't remember exactly what she said. I wrote it down. I pinned it to my wall because it was just the rope I needed out, which was it happens to her, too. And she's a pure winning author. So it's like, oh, this is a stage in the journey. This is a step. This, I'm not in the wrong place. This is just part of the this is part of writing a book. And once I had that in my head, I then I did really tap into my methodical mind. And I just broke it all down into pieces. I was just like, okay, just do this piece and then do this piece and see if they fit together. Okay, do this piece and this piece and see if they fit together. And I just, and I got through that. But I do remember those few days of overwhelm were not fun. They were not fun. They were like, I don't know how this is going to (laughs) work. So, um, so I think toward the last quarter of the book and then definitely once you get out of your first draft and you're going back into the big editing process, then it's much easier to be methodical and be like, okay, this week I have 40 hours. I'm going to work on chapter four. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I need to get chapter four done by Friday for this next draft. So I think the the beginning part of the book, which is getting the first draft done is pretty soft and loose, but I will say to you, and I'm curious to hear your feedback on this because there's the chapters are not um, in any way uh, the same. You know, some are like 12 pages and some like 90 pages. And so there were things that I knew when I finished this book to the point that I was good with it. And I had people reading it who's, who were either writers themselves or people deep in the literary world who I valued their opinion to say, is this ready for publication? And they were like, oh, yeah, Absolutely. I knew that there were things I could go in and change and fix and do better. But that would have been one of those stories of, oh, I've been writing this novel for three years, five years. You know what I mean? It's like, no, I want to I want to move on. Like, it's not perfect, but I was OK with that. But my question to you is, did you find it odd structurally? Were there things that you found really difficult that reflected a lack of editing, you know, just as like, and I'm really serious. Like I would love your feedback because it's only going to help me in the next book. No, there wasn't. And, you know, but I, I agree with you, right? It is one of those things where it's always like, ah, I wish I'd done this differently. What I, it's funny, what I tend to do is after my book's out and, you know, I have edited it till the cows come home. Um, then I, I'll go through and I'm like, Oh my God, how did I not see this? And then I'll just mock it up. And then so, okay. So next version, I will make this change. Right. So there it is. Yeah. You know, yep. like it's, yeah. Sometimes, you know, you're just like, you're like, okay, good enough is good enough. I, I've done the best mm-hmm. I can. It's getting, yeah. you know, it's been through the ringer with edits and reviews. And so it's like, okay, let's, let's put this baby out into the world. And, um, yeah, but there's always room for growth and improvement is what I find with my own books. But no, there's nothing that comes to mind to me with yours. Um, oh, good. Thank you. That's yeah. Great. I mean, I'd be fine if you did because I can see things that I would do differently but I think that's the whole process like my goal right now is to just have iterations like this next book coming out will benefit from everything I learned on this first book and then the third book will benefit so that by the fourth book I feel like I'll be like really hitting cruising altitude 
and being like, this is smooth. This is polished. I like this, you know, um, because I think the only way you can do something that you've never done before is just keep doing it and be really comfortable with the places that you fall down. You're like, oh, like, like for me, the marketing side of like, you need to have a marketing plan. I'm like, good to know. I will remember that next time. I just wasn't thinking about it. I just wasn't coming from that mindset. And so, um, yeah, I just sort of feel like you just learn, you don't know what you don't know. And so you just have to be really comfortable with that and say, oh, I, I didn't know that. Good to know. Now I know. So, and you learn, and you learn about yourself too, right? Of course. What kind of, how do you approach writing a book when you know that the story is there, the, uh, the idea of the book is there? Uh, what's your approach? Well, you know what I was going to say that I think ties into your like, oh, I didn't think of marketing plan is, you know, my first two having been traditionally published is like I had to create a book proposal, which is basically your business plan for the book. So uh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. So, you know, you're always kind of thinking about like, okay, what are my complimentary titles? Like what other books out there are similar? How's mine's different? Okay, what will I do to market it? Like you have to do this stuff to submit it. And so mm -hmm. even though I didn't try to get these last four traditionally published, I still went through that process. Even if I didn't write a formal book proposal, I still went through that process of like, okay, Got what's it. something similar? What, you know, what is my marketing plan for this? Or how will I get this book out into the world? So there's a great book. It's called um, How to Write a Book Proposal by Michael Larson. And I think it it's for fiction also, but it's like the kind of the Bible for this. So mm. it might be fun for you to check out and for listeners to check out anyone who wants to write a book. It's a wonderful place to start because, you know, writing your book proposal, I think, is actually harder than writing the book because you have to pull together your chapters, your really like your chapter titles, your chapter summaries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. one once you know that from a structure perspective, you can fill in the rest. Right. Oh, that's great to know. That's great to know. Well, so Elizabeth. Yeah, I can see that totally. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I highly recommend that book. And that, that's actually um, – you know, my second book, I remember I did a mind map for it because I'd written the formal book proposal. It got picked up by the publisher. And then as I started writing it, it was like, oh. And so I morphed it a bit by just like sitting down one day and just mind mapping. And so, you know, sometimes you're just like, oh, I thought this would go into that chapter, but I'm not liking it, you know? And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. yep. Totally. Totally. Well, so my last question for you, Elizabeth, and I'm sure this has shifted since the last time we spoke is, um, you know, the name of this podcast, Tranquility Du Jour. So how do you find tranquility in your days right now? It sounds like you've really, really gravitated towards writing. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Well, this is funny because this week has been cray cray. The, the last, I would say 2019. I'd be interested to know how your, reader, your listeners feel. 2019 was hard year at least for me and it feels like for a lot of people in just a, just a lot of energies and from July until last week I have been traveling traveling and teaching and teaching and traveling so I only just felt like I woke up at home back to my life on Wednesday which is two days ago and this week we're doing all the big lifting to get our website launched for Squam so it hasn't been tranquil it's been very constant full long days dropping into bed kind of thing but at the core of my life and I'm sure I've shared this with you before because it's what I call my sacred morning energy is I do have my touchstone as you do where I get up and I have my coffee now I take my puppy outside for a few but then I burn incense I um, journal I connect with the prayers and the teachings that speak to my heart and keep me grounded to the universal divinity. And, and that's, you know, that's how I start my day. And that's my touchstone right now. It's very, very tiny, skinny part of my day. It's maybe 30 minutes, possibly 40 minutes. Um, yesterday I got to take my dog and his best friend for a walk out in this beautiful old farm. And it was a beautiful, warm day. And the leaves smelled gorgeous. And I was like, oh, I miss this. I miss this because that would be part of my tranquility is just to be out 
doing long, long walks. And I haven't had that for a while, but I would say my core approach is the morning. I set my, I set my calibration in the morning. And then once I open my laptop, all bets are off. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Then, then everything changes. No, I love that. I think it's a Great reminder, you know, of um, let, making sure that no matter how crazy things are, that your mornings are like set up for success. So thank you, mm-hmm. Elizabeth, so much as always for being with us. It's always a treat to have you. I'm so honored. Thank you for inviting me. And I just like always happy to connect with you. Savvy Sources. So there are links to find Elizabeth's website, Elizabeth Duvuvier, Instagram, same handle, Facebook, same handle, and of course her book, Stories for My Sister. And she's offering 20% off for all Tranquility Du Jour listeners with code Tranquility Love. And this is valid through December 21st. Now, if you would like to enter to win a copy, a signed copy of this beautiful book, Share a screenshot of you listening to this podcast and tag me at Tranquility Du Jour or share a takeaway from the podcast using hashtag TDJ podcast. I'll choose a winner randomly from the social media posts on Saturday, December 21st. Let's connect. In the show notes, I have links to iTunes and Amazon and would be so grateful if you took a moment to pin a review of any of my books and or this show. I wanted to share a recent review of Hip Trinkle Chick that came out in November, right around the time that I hosted the Hip Trinkle Chick 13th year birthday party. How has that been 13 years? You can find that in the uh, over on the YouTube channel. And it was such a fun event. Loved being with you all for that hour. Now, Robin writes, Hip Trinkle Chick is my very, very favorite book. The first time I read it, when it ended, I actually cried. My husband asked why I was crying. And I said, because I'm so sad I finished my book. I've read this book several times and I'm pulling it off my bookshelf to read once again. For me, this book is a life changer. I followed Kimberly Wilson on her blog and YouTube channel for years. I've ordered many of her products and everything she puts out never disappoints. She's a warm, kind-hearted, wise woman. Yay for Kimberly. Everything she writes is to help strengthen women in a very hard world. Read this book and be ready to be empowered. Thank you so much, Robin, for pinning this. I really, really appreciate it. And for any and for anyone else who has a moment to pen a review on Amazon, send me a note with a link to the review and I will send you a snail mail postcard glittery Parisian postcard. Finally, if you would like to find more episodes, visit KimberlyWilson.com slash podcast. And of course, you can subscribe in Apple Podcasts or Overcast. If you're not on the Tranquility Du Jour mailing list, you can sign up to get exclusive content, personal updates, giveaways, and more. And that's at KimberlyWilson.com slash love notes. So you'll find all this and more over in the show notes, KimberlyWilson.com slash 474. Wishing you a beautiful, beautiful holiday. And thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's an honor to host you and have you in the Tranquility Du Jour community. Namaste. Namaste.